I knew I was going to forget. Okay. So effective client engagement. Let's, let's define client engagement. Let's start there. It's a skill-based approach to building rapport and enhancing motivation using a host of validated evidence-based techniques with the goal of empowering the individual to make sustainable and measurable behavioral changes. These techniques should be delivered in a culturally competent manner that is responsive to the participant's unique set of criminogenic needs. So when we're talking about punitive approaches, such as confrontation or arguing, do not encourage or promote effective client engagement. Those types of things don't ever get us to where we wanna go. In these cases, we need to roll with resistance, utilize active listening, give feedback, ask questions. All of these approaches are much better approach to having a positive impact on client engagement. Utilizing a strength-based approach by focusing your interactions on the strengths of the participant and how we leverage those strengths to address criminogenic need areas. Punitive approaches have been found to be very ineffective in facilitating participant engagement, and in fact, usually pushes the client further away. Does our interactions move the participant towards achieving their goals? This is the question we should ask ourselves on a very consistent basis. Benefits of effective client engagement. There are six bullet points here. The first, greater range of skills and resources. You need to develop a greater range of skills and resources by utilizing motivational interviewing, asking open-ended questions, assessing participant motivation, and knowing our own body language, including making eye contact, facing the individual, of course, we're doing that in a socially distanced way these days, and not being distracted by the computer or cell phone. We all have had those moments where there's a thousand things going on in our lives, but when you're engaging with your client, you wanna make sure you're attentive to, to them, including looking at them and, and seeing them. Develop a greater grasp on the subject matter you deal with directly. Dealing with an individual with a learning disability, for example, you should learn ways to best assist that person. If they can't read or they struggle with, with different focusing issues, Take the time to sit there and read the document with them so that you're gaining their trust and knowing that you're understanding where they're coming from. Increase your knowledge and your understanding. Greater understanding of motivation techniques. Motivation techniques include motivational interviewing, cost-benefit analysis, assessing a person's motivation and levels of change, restructuring negative self-talk and helping individuals to set goals for themselves. Greater ability to identify risk and protective factors. As you are working and engaging individuals, you are creating an environment to encourage them to discuss their needs and strengths. This is a benefit of effective client engagement. Also, identifying both internal and external barriers that may be a challenge. For example, if you have a client that doesn't have a car, this is going to seriously limit their ability to get to appointments, especially if they live in an area that doesn't have public transportation. More complete range of community services available. Your job as a provider is to make sure you know who your partners are or who the service providers are within your area and the ability to access them. For a community, uh, for county reentry task force rather, service providers can also be your, your co-chairs and work as part of a team with you. A healthy representation of providers should always have a seat at the table when it comes to the workings of your county reentry task force. And lastly, more successful outcomes with clients. By utilizing all of the above points that we just made, you will have a much more successful outcome with your client or participant. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Nicole Aldi. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Melinda. Now we're gonna briefly talk about a couple of the principles of effective intervention, most specifically the risk, need, and responsivity principle, R&R. &R. Risk is who. The risk principle tells us who to target. Um, meaning, is this person at a high or a low risk of recidivizing in the criminal justice system? The risk principle states that intensive programming should be focused primarily on higher risk individuals. Additionally, research tells us that giving lower risk in individuals too much intervention or supervision can increase recidivism. Assessment results help us to prioritize our limited services. 
we reserve higher levels of interventions and supervisions for the higher risk individuals. The second is need. Need is equals to what? The need principle states that interventions and programs should target dynamic criminogenic risk factors and those areas highly correlated with criminal behavior. Dynamic criminogenic risk factors are those factors that can be changed. And finally, responsivity. Responsivity is what we're going to delve into a little bit more in this webinar. Um, for example, a, um, an effective intervention it tells us how to change behavior. Responsivity is the how. There are two components to the responsivity principle, general and specific. General responsivity suggests that we adopt the model of intervention that most clients respond to. Um, in the criminal justice field, that is the cognitive behavioral interventions. Cognitive behavioral interventions involve focusing on how thinking affects behavior, involves the restructuring of thinking, emotional regulation, and teaching new skills to, to correct behavioral deficits. Now we're going to delve into even more of the um, how we intervene. General responsivity is shown to what work what works for a specific population. For example, as I said before, in the criminal justice system, Cognitive-based interventions and motivational interviewing are strategies that have proven to work for indiv individuals involved in the criminal justice population as in general. Specific responsivity is what will work for a person specifically. For example, if you have a person who is not, who um, English is not their first language, it would be responsive to provide a curriculum in their first language. This type of reasoning goes along with the ways that you can engage individuals, as Melinda identified earlier. General engagement techniques. First, avoid argumentation. The definition of argue is to exchange or express diverging or opposite views, typically in a heated or angry way. This type of confrontation also often leads to walls being built up and individuals not really listening to one another and, produce, and proves to be ineffective. We want to roll resistance. Rolling with resistance involves approaching resistance without judgment and interpreting these responses as a sign that the individual holds a different perspective to the professional. Using strategies such as simple reflection of the resistance, emphasizing the individual's choice to change or not, it's up to them, and shifting the focus on the discussion or simply reframing what the person has said in order to roll resistance and prevent resistance from affecting engagement. Next, you want to identify discrepancies. Assisting individuals to identify discrepancies between their current behavior and their future goals or values about themselves as a person, partner, parent, or worker is a powerful motivator that helps tip the balance towards change. Using um, things like, you're saying this, but your actions show this is a good way to develop the discrepancy between what a person wants and how they're, what they're doing. Finally, support self-efficacy. By, by highlighting the individual strengths and reflecting on times in their life when they have successfully changed, even if it's in just a small area, self-efficacy can be promoted. The professional's belief in an individual's ability to change is a powerful way to promote self-efficacy. By promoting self-efficacy, the professional can help the individual develop the confidence that they are capable of change. Okay, next, we're going to talk about structured engagement techniques. First, identifying and managing barriers. You want to work with an individual to identify all possible barriers to their change. You will work with the individual to help brainstorm ways to manage or overcome the identified barriers to make a plan. Next, you can use engagement strategies like a thinking report or behavior change. Thinking report, as many of you that have been trained in thinking for a change know, incorporates four things. Identifying the situation, identifying your thoughts about the situation, identifying your feelings about the situation, and identifying your attitudes and beliefs about the situation. By taking a look at these four distinct parts, you are able to identify what your risk thought is and ho hopefully catch that to change, to restructure your thought to change the behavior. 
a behavior chain is very simple, similar to this process, and it is something that is used in ethics. Cost-benefit analysis are another um, technique for structured engagement. Think, um, sorry, not all choices are 100% one way or another. So a lot of us might do pro-con list, which is very similar. Exploring the pros and cons of change to help an individual develop discrepancy. These decisional balance exercises are used effectively in mental and motivational interviewing to help pay, uh, individuals tease apart their ambivalence and help the individual express their concerns about their behavior. Restructuring negative self-talk. Negative self-talk, also known as cognitive restructuring. One, you want to pay attention to your thinking. Two, you recognize the risk in that thinking. And then three, replace that risk thinking with new thinking. This is a way to um, change that negative self-talk that an individual has exhibited. Finally, setting a goal. Setting goals, both short-term, with smart, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely goals, and long-term goals with action steps help keep both the professional and the individual on task and create a map for um, change. And now I'm going to turn it over to Shana. Thanks, Nicole. Yes, this is Shana. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. The first key here is, the building, is helping to build motivation. This is really to recognize when your clients are lacking the motivation to change risky behaviors. You all know not everyone is in the, going to be in the same place. You've got to meet people where they are at. It's really important, you know, to bridge the gaps with your clients. The stages of change model is a very useful tool to determine where a client is and their readiness to change for their behaviors so that when you're working with them, you can match their intervention to their stage of change. And let's really take a look now to look at this particular model. So the key points here, you'll see here with this photo, is that change is a process, not an event. You know, you could take this in your own life and not just with your participants. There are stages such as pre-contemplation at first, maybe not aware that you even need to make a change or the clients might not understand that they, they need to or they don't want to make the change. Possibly they're contemplating it. This particular stage is marked by ambivalence. Maybe they want to change, could want to stay the same, not quite sure. But maybe they're going to be taking the next step of preparation. At this particular stage, people have made the decision. I'm going to make the change, I'm going to get ready to make the change. Next is action. This is when they're really going to be getting into actually make, making, you know, making that change, jumping into it. They're going to be implementing, putting their plans together for the change. And maintenance is the important part about the individuals practicing their new behaviors and concentration, you know, particularly maybe with relapse prevention and things of that nature. And really it's a cyclical type of thing. As you know, um, with your clients, it could go back and forth from any time. So here now, this is really about matching your delivery style to a client's engagement. This is really key here with the self-determination in terms of intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic motivation from the outside, intrinsic from within. So really self-determination is a theory of motivation that aims to explain an individual's goal-directed behavior. Really want to look at those goals in terms of how you're really going to you know, get at what's going on here and where's the best part to start. For intrinsic motivation, this is where it's driven or fueled by internal rewards. It's really engaging in a behavior that a person will find personally rewarding. Essentially, you know, a person performs an activity not to receive external rewards but for their own satisfaction. Autonomy is really important here in the freedom of choice. For example, Autonomy is high when individuals feel they are engaging with someone because they choose to do so, not because they feel pressured by other people or external factors, because why would you want to change then? You know, they don't want it to be about the high expectations of others. But really, in, in a different aspect to that, looking at the intrinsic, excuse me, the extrinsic or controlled motivation, this really characterizes those activities that yield specific outcomes in terms of rewards or avoided punishments. Within extrinsic, 
motivation, there's a continuum of behavioral regulations. This really reflects the degree to which behavior has been integrated into the individual sense of self. So it's important to know the differences and meeting your clients where they're at, which I'm sure you guys do and, and do very well, but just to, to really see the differences and work, work with them and where they're at and proceed from there. And Michelle, it's all you. Michelle, are you? Hello, everyone. Michelle has. Been, oh, Technology, there she is. I was just going to. Technology at its finest. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you for your patience, uh, and thank you, Shana. Um, I'm going to walk us through the next few slides here in our client engagement uh, PowerPoint. This is a topic that is, is fairly near and dear to my heart with respect to client engagement, and that is the process of procedural justice. Simply said, uh, procedural justice is fairness. It's, it's fairness in all the processes that impact justice-involved individuals. Procedural justice refers to the idea that how individuals regard our system, the justice system, is more closely linked to their perceived fairness in the process and not so much the outcome. Procedural justice at its core is a movement to ensure system fairness at every point of one's interaction within the criminal justice system. There are essentially four elements uh, of, uh, critical elements rather, of procedural justice. They're going to be explained in this slide. First, understanding rights and transparency. It is important that community correction professionals are transparent and clear in action, which means that individuals comprehend the probation or other ATI process expectations and consequences clearly. Neutrality and partiality in decision making. It's important that individuals have the perception that the decision making process is unbiased and trustworthy. Third, a voice. Individuals should have the perception, and, and it should be so, that, the, that their side of the story and their input on how to best plan for themselves and the program has been heard. Last, respect, dignity, and caring. It is important that individuals have the perception that at each point in the system and across interactions, they will be treated with dignity and respect. A major component of, of the work that we're doing these days um, with, with clients, you know, is, is an emphasis on trauma-informed care. Uh, the following information I'm presenting is provided um, with, with a lot of input from a gentleman by the name of Sean Ginwright. He um, delivered a presentation called From Trauma-Informed Care to Healing-Centered Engagement, a conversation with Sean Ginwright on February 1st of 2019. I encourage you to research this gentleman, look at his work and presentations, and presentations for a deeper understanding of this process. We have a tendency to address people based on what we know about them. Uh, but what happens when we address someone in a way, of course, that offends them? And I'm thinking that we may have done that from time to time. What happens when we do that in the course of our work with criminal justice involved individuals what I can say is that sometimes what we don't know about someone, of course, is the trauma that they have experienced that they don't wear, you know, on their sleeve uh, within the criminal justice system and beyond. So here are some helpful hints when using a trauma-informed approach to client engagement. One, it is important to view individuals through a trauma lens in our work. Realize that trauma exists in environments as well as within an individual. It is the optimal goal to address the root causes of trauma in our work with individuals and to help them find individuals within the helping profession to help them do so as well. And moving beyond treating the symptoms to building a resilience to supporting healing from trauma all around. 
this, le this next slide um, is, is, a, is a meaningful quote, um, in my opinion. I am more than what happens to me. I am not just my trauma. Um, how many of you can say that? And of course, how many of us can think about someone who we work with that, that could or would say that? Um, ways for us to help folks handle and move through their trauma and most importantly heal from it um, are as follows. Hopefully we are all um, aware of the opportunities that individuals have in our programs for civic engagement, helping participants engage in strength-based approaches to community problem solving, getting them involved in their community, helping them to cultivate connections with people in their community, offering that they perhaps should share their story with individuals, um, always practicing empathy in our work, recognizing the value of inclusivity and belonging in communities and our institutions, and lastly, always fostering a culture of connectedness with our individuals. Okay, so moving on to the, to the next slide, just want to offer you some resources here. The distance learning modules and other resources are available in the integrated justice portal and the community corrections tab. Um, specifically, um, client engagement is module nine in the distance learning modules. Uh, we offer um, ATI programs, employment focused services programs, county or entry task forces, probation departments, free access to the nine web based distance learning modules um, that include evidence based practices. Uh, again, it's open to all of our grantees. The grantees can participate in QA webinars with experts from the University of the Cincinnati. Um, of Cincinnati Corrections Institution, Institute, Institute blah, <laughs> otherwise known as UCCI, and the resource library on effective interventions and practices is accessible um, through the Integrated Justice Portal as well. Okay, we are now ready to um, hear voices from the field. Our first presentation will be from Ms. Casey Hall, the Rensselaer County Reentry Task Force Coordinator, and then Nicole Willoughby, Program Director of Project Moore in Dutchess County. Casey? Hi, Michelle. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, so when I first meet with my participants, either in person or on the phone, I explain to them what my job is um, and that it's really to assist them in transitioning from incarceration to being home. I explain to them who I am and what the task force does, and I try to explain to them what their expectations, what my expectations of them are as far as their responsibilities and participating in the task force as well as what they can expect from me and what my responsibilities are to them. I want to make sure that they understand what their participation with the task force truly means. Um, I know they're coming from a place where they're kind of programmed and serviced out, so I really want them to have a positive experience when working with the task force and look at my program as a help rather than a hindrance. Um, in order to do that, I, you know, I know we all have our intake and our service coordination paperwork that we want to fill out. But instead of going question by question, I try to have an open dialogue with the individual and, and strike a conversation with them. And usually by doing that, that draws out the answers that I'm looking for anyway. And Michelle hit upon talking about trauma and how we might not necessarily know about that information. And oftentimes when I have that conversation with an individual, I'm getting more information than I would by um, following just the script, quote unquote, that I have um, and asking those questions. So it really allows me to get a deeper look at who this individual is and helps me assist them in putting together that service coordination plan and helping them with different types of referrals. Um, usually I'll try to talk to them and see, you know, what are your goals and what do you need to achieve those goals? What are some of your barriers and what are you looking for for help from the task force? And a lot of times I get, you know, answers like food, transportation, housing, employment you know, the basic things that we do regularly assist with. So I use that to my advantage to kind of get the client buy-in. I will offer them uh, transportation as bus pass is, as a way to get that. Um, it's something tangible that they see value in and it's given to them right away. Um, I tend to try not to make promises and especially promises that I know I can't keep. And I follow through on what I say I'm gonna do. So if I tell them I'm gonna make a referral to them to a program, I make sure that I make that referral and I follow up with the individual. Um, and I try not to make extra work for my clients, so I don't necessarily schedule appointments with them to come and meet with me. Um, I try to do as much check-in as I can via text or phone or email. 
I also will meet with my participants uh, where they're at. So I schedule pre-COVID. <laughs> I would schedule uh, individuals. I would meet with them at the local one stop when they were there. I would meet with them at the DSS when they were there or, you know, wherever they really were at. Um, and I try to advocate for them as strongly as I can. Uh, one of the things that I also do to, to enhance my client engagement is I meet with any and all service providers that I refer my participants to. So that way I so know, like I know. They, uh, what they're going to, ex what they should expect when they go to meet with one of these service providers. So I know a lot of times when people are coming home, they're nervous about being referred to specific programs or what to expect when they go there. So if I've met with them already and I know what the expectations are, I can convey that information to my clients. Um, basically, I, I make the task force worth their while, client engagement for Ready, Set, Work, and Thinking for a Change. Um, I bring back successful participants who have gone through these programs prior to talk to the new participants uh, the first day of the group. So it gives the clients that kind of boost that they need to see that this is something that might be beneficial for them. And it gives them a positive feeling um, towards being in that participation. So, you know, I try to explain to them that we're not here to make more work for them. We're here to assist them and, and get through, you know, their parole supervision and, and, and really become uh, contributing members to society. Um, you know, I use, I use what I can in, in COVID times. You know, we don't have those uh, those solar skills that a lot of us depend on, you know, the, that eye contact and that, that face to face interviews. So one of the things that I've been using much more is FaceTime and scheduling Zoom meetings for my clients so that I can have that kind of face to face interaction. Um, and I find that that's working out very well because a lot of times when I'm talking to somebody just specifically over a phone call, it's, it's hard to engage. It's hard to have that connection with that individual. So when you do, have that face-to-face -face time, it, it does kind of give them a little bit more of an incentive to work with me. Um, you know, I show respect to my clients. I model, I model behavior for them as far as what I expect of them. I encourage them instead of enabling them. I try to empower them. So if somebody needs assistance in, in making an appointment for themselves, of course I will step in and I will help to schedule something. But if I know somebody is quite capable of making a phone call for themselves and scheduling something, I will put the onus on them um, so that, you know, it gives them the, the feeling that they are capable of doing things for themselves. And I would rather empower somebody rather than um, enable them. Because I, ultimately the goal is for them to not rely upon the task force. Uh, it is to be self-sufficient. Um, and then again, I don't hesitate to push when I need to. If, if I think somebody is making an excuse, I'll call them out on that. Um, you know, I don't get too involved as far as like, um, like butting heads with somebody, but I'll try to keep them on track and, and keep them from, you know, keep them doing what they're supposed to be doing in order to have a positive uh, transition home. That's pretty much all I have. Thank you, Casey. We're turning it over to Nicole Willoughby now, Program Director of Project MORE. Hello, thank you. Um, so um, we have four state programs um, that uh, we have. We have two that are in the community um, actually three in the community, and then we have one in the Dutchess County Jail. And that's the one that I'll talk about now, um, our CBI program in the Dutchess County Jail. And um, the way that we engage clients in there, we start at the screening process. Um, at the screening process, it's usually the case manager that will be on the unit with the client um, and a clinician that will also see them on um, the unit. So we try to build that client engagement from day one. So when they're doing the screening process, um, right now due to COVID, we're actually doing the screening process over Zoom um, in the jail. So at that point, the um, clients have a familiar face that they can see. So when they go on a unit and those case managers are on the unit with them, um, it, it gives them that, that sense of, it's, 
someone that um, they're used to seeing. Um, so it all starts, like I said, at the screening process. Once they're screened and they're moved over to um, our restart, or the unit 22, um, that is one of the, the best units in the jail. So just coming on that unit is right there, they call it like almost like a reward. So to be on this unit, it's a reward for them. So that's when we can start the engagement with them, getting the rules and regulations um, to stay on this unit. So um, like I said, from day one, we're, we're getting them prepared for that. And as they come on the unit, they're actually not just doing like MRT, but they also start with a stages of change group. So in that group, um, just like Shana talked about, um, they're talking about that pre-contemplative and contemplative stages of change, and they're going through um, that process um, so that they're, they're getting an understanding of um, where they are and where they like to be um, when they're talking about those stages of change. And what we notice is that um, with them going through that group, it kind of helps them when they're in like an MRT um, or an anger management group um, on the unit because it gives them that ownership um, to basically know, you know, the things that they need to change within themselves. But they also, which is great to see, they also hold each other accountable in their groups as well. Um, and a lot of times we see them referring back to um, the stages of change where they say, you know what, it sounds like you're in the pre-contemplative stage of change. And, and it's great to hear and see because they're actually working those stages, um, which is a great thing. Um, and with the case managers, they're meeting with these individuals um, weekly. So when they're on the unit, um, it's not just about, you know, planning. They also take a step back and get to know how are you feeling? How are you doing um, with COVID? Um, how are you doing with the new regulations in the jail due to COVID? Things like that. Um, what are you worried about? Are you worried about, like, your family on the outside? And so they're getting to that point where the individuals are having that feeling like, wow, somebody actually is cares about me, um, and they're getting to that point where they're feeling heard. I think that was that's the biggest thing, for them to feel heard, um, and they have a teammate almost, because we always say that with client engagement, it's all about that collaboration. Um, we're not here to be dictators to tell them what to do. Uh, we get more success if, when we're talking to them, we're using a lot of what are we going to do so that you can be successful? We're putting it on them, but we're letting them know that, you know, if you take a step forward, we're right here to take that step with you. Um, so that collaboration is something that um, we really drive home um, with our individuals to tell them that, you know what, we're on your team and we're here. We have these tools and when you're ready to use them, we're here so that um, we can give you the capability to do so. Um, and then when we're talking about those intrinsic motivations, we really try to talk about to our clients about these things, pulling what's already within them out. Um, so it's kind of, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, what are your goals? What are those barriers that are in your way that you feel like you can't achieve those goals? Um, and then how can we get over these barriers? So we're doing a lot of that motivational interviewing and that spirit of MI, MI to get them to get through that process um, into those action and those planning stages um, throughout the program. And we also have, um, just like Casey was talking about, once they're done with the program and they're released into the community, um, we will drive them to their first appointment, or if they're going to treatment, we'll drive them to um, their treatment facility. And we also have a, a pulse group that we're doing um, on Zoom. So when they're in the community, um, two days a week, 
we have um, a Zoom program where they can get on Zoom and, and there we're just talking about um, how they're doing in the community. Um, what are their struggles? What do they need help with? And we're actually helping them while they're in the community as well. So um, if they're not on probation and we're not doing that soft handoff to another one of our um, outside programs, we're still reaching out to them and um, making sure that um, they're still doing what they need to do and they're on the right track and they still have that support because I think that's the biggest thing. Um, it's not just about having that client engagement while they're in our program, but it's also having that follow through. Once they leave, can they reach back in um, to get assistance from us? And we try to make sure that we do keep that line of communication um, open with them. Um, and it comes out as genuine. I think that's the, the biggest thing um, is that they feel we we have to make sure that we have that empathy um, because we want them to be able, if they're in trouble or even if they're not, if they just need help with, um, they have a job interview or and they need some assistance um, with the interviewing, practicing for that, they can always reach back. Um, and I think that's the one of the our biggest claim to fame is that um, we allow them to reach back to us because we're trying to reduce that recidivism in the community. We don't ever want them to feel like um, once they leave, that's it. Um, they can't call us um, or come on one of our Zoom meetings um, if they have a question or if they just need some help. Um, and um, in the community, quickly, I think the Women's Center would be a great example um, of this kind of engagement because just the environment when you first walk into um, the Women's Center is engaging. It's a program that's for women, um, ran by women, and I think when our female clients walk in there, that feeling, um, you, they always say like, you know, this is a breath of fresh air for us. Um, and I think that's what grabs your attention, just walking in there. Um, the environment is um, just so inviting. Um, and then just like in the jail programs, they also have their case manager there um, to go through that spirit of MI with them. They're doing, they're working their groups. Um, they have daycare. So they're really um, hitting on all of their their barriers um, that they have while they're in the community, they're being addressed. Um, and then a lot of times the, for them, uh, this is the first time that they're feeling listened to or heard. And um, once you get to that point, um, I would say once an uh, individual comes to you and they say that, like, you know what, this is the first time I feel heard or the first time I feel like um, I can move forward or I can do it or I can be successful, that's when you know that the engagement um, was was exactly what you needed it to be. Thank you very much, Nicole. No At problem. this time, hello, Melinda. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, we want to thank definitely both Nicole and Casey for your your very in depth and detailed um, conversations about how you actually engage your clients and what you do. Um, that, was, that was so great. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today to be able to provide some field and frontline experience. And I want to thank everybody so much today for joining us for our Lunch and Learn webinar series. We hope that you found this information to be valuable and applicable to your everyday work. The next Lunch and Learn webinar will be on Wednesday, October 7th at noon. And this topic is going to be ongoing collaboration with referral sources. So we hope to see you there. Um, we do want to take a second to if there are any questions or any, any questions or concerns that people have or they want to ask. Um, and also I want to check the chat to see if there are any questions within there um, that people have posted. I did see one person asked if they could get a copy of this presentation. 
Yeah, the uh, the PowerPoint, uh, the webinar will be is taped, has been taped, and will be posted to the DCJS website uh, soon. Let's answer that. Any other questions anybody has? If you want to come off mute or you want to throw them in the chat. All righty. Well, if you have any remaining questions or concerns, please do feel free to contact any one of us. We'd be more than happy to, to answer anything or respond to any comments that you might have. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Great job, everybody. Yeah. Sorry, Melinda, about the beep. Okay. Oh my gosh. You want you can hit um stop record now. That's what I'm trying. Okay. And look, the